saving one, he's the saving one. Shout for joy, see what love has done. He has come for us, he's the saving one. Shout for joy, for the Son of God is the saving one. Saving one, shout for joy. See what love has done. He has come for us. He's the saving Jesus, you have saved us. There is no other God who reigns. You are the name above all names. Jesus, you have saved us. There is no other God like you. We sing the praises that you're due. Jesus. You have saved us. There is no other God who reigns. You are the name above all names. Jesus, you have saved us. Shout for joy for the Son of God. Is the saving one. Is the saving one. Saving one, shout for joy for the Son of God is the saving one. He's the saving one. Shout for joy, see what love has done. He has come for us. He's the saving. Praise God. Praise God. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless hearts. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise. Oh God, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for oh, hallelujah. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for oh, me. Your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children, remember 
saved through faith not of works lest any man should boast amen aren't you thankful today for the grace of God aren't you thankful that he sheds his grace that it's amazing amen his amazing grace we're going to in just a minute or so we're going to sing that song again I I just want to his grace is sufficient it's enough and I'd like for you to do something with me. When we come to that part where it says, remember your people. How many of you remember times of being in a classroom situation and they ask who, who has the answer for this? And you waved your hand. Anybody? Wave your hand and try. See if you can, you know. How many of you would like for him to remember his people? Remember his children. Remember his promise. Could you just give a wave offering before him as we're singing that? Give him praise. Father God, we come in the name of Jesus praising you for your grace, your mercy, and your loving kindness extended to us. We pray, Father, we would just step into the waters of your presence today and be overwhelmed by what you want to do in each of our lives. As we continue to look, Father, at what happens when the problems of men and women collide with the power of an almighty God. Father God, meet with us today, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue to worship. If you're a guest with us today, there's a connection card in the back of the seat in front of you. Fill that out, drop it in, and also... On your way out, pick up one of these free DVDs, uh, a record of your visit with us. Thank you for being with us today. We want to let you know as we're praising God, I invite you to step out and come and the brethren are here to pray with you. You can come and pray. There's prayer request and prayer list down here at the altar. Just come and worship Him. His grace is enough. Amen. Let's give him praise. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness O oh God. God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Praise God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace 
my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, a rescue for sin. Jesus Messiah, Lord of Lord. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out, all for love. Behold the tree. There was torn a love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from 
the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. I invite you to continue to worship him as you're seated, to give him praise and honor. Thank you, worship team. We want to share just a couple things, reminder to you. First of all, tonight, Chauncey's going to be preaching tonight. Oh, ooh, all right. Be sure and get here for that. Also, coming up, we have an impact Sunday, the last Sunday of August, on a Sunday morning, where you get to be the evangelists and bring people in. Go out, and as Jesus said, to the highways, the byways, and compel them. To come in. We're going to be sharing in that morning service a brand new drama, John the Revelator. And then in the evening service, we're going to start a series of messages preaching through the book of Revelation. But in the morning service, this drama would give an opportunity for you to invite someone out, bring someone to church. Let's fill the house. And uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ because whether you know it or not, if you haven't noticed, signs of the times are everywhere. And Jesus is coming again. We don't know when. We're not saying when because we don't know. No, not even the angels of heaven are privy to that information. But we know this. Jesus said, be ready, for you know not what hour your Lord is coming again. We need to be compelling people to get their hearts and lives ready. Some that you may be able to contact and bring in, perhaps that might be the day. That might be the time where the Holy Spirit moves upon their heart. They receive Jesus as Savior, and you would have a part to play in that evangelism. In launching our 
August time of evangelism and outreach, next Saturday evening begins our involvement in what we're calling Prayer Force One. We're inviting you to come out for a one-hour time of prayer. Here in the church, we'll be anointing, we'll be praying, we'll not be preaching, we'll just be praying and believing God. If you say, well, I live on the other side of town or I can't make it out at that time, then covenant to set aside that hour between 6 and 7 to pray. Pray for a move of God's Holy Spirit. Pray for revival, for salvations, for people to come to know Jesus, for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, for people to be healed by the power of God, for miracles to be in place. And so we're inviting you to come on board, Prayer Force One, and see what a difference, an hour of prayer. Jesus even said to his disciples, could you not tarry with me even one hour? And we're inviting you to, be a, to step on board Prayer Force One and set the stage for what God wants to do. Become an evangelist. There are also flyers in your bulletin about the drama and also, there's some available out for you to take some others. Post them at places. Give them to friends, neighbors, relatives. If you have any enemies, be sure and give them to them. And uh, uh, we, need to, we need to reach out so that people can know that it's time to reach up to a God who's coming again. Right now, we're going to invite the ushers to gather. We're going to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Terry's going to lead us in prayer, and Carissa's going to be sharing a number in song. Let's ready our hearts to continue to give him praise in the offering. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We have the opportunity to give and sow seed into your kingdom for the expansion of your ministry. And Lord, I just ask that this church would continue to be a beacon of light, that souls would be saved, and that as we give, your kingdom would be expanded. Lord, we ask that you bless each gift and each giver in Jesus' name. And all, 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 of, all of us said, Amen. Spinning a heavenly dance, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice, all that once it's a gentle and thundering noise, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming.
I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. And God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. Would you stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word today? Turn to Luke, Luke chapter 19, and beginning with verse number 1. We're continuing to look at what happens when the problems of man collide with the power of an almighty God. Praise God. Beginning with verse number one. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. <laughs> he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today... I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, all, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Jesus said to him, 
Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Father, bless your word to our comprehension. But more than that, bless it to our living it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I heard a noise of a phone being turned off, and it reminded me that I had not done so myself. I hate to get those calls in the middle of the service, you know, especially when you're up here. So embarrassing. Last week we began looking at a single solitary city, Jericho. It was known as the city of a curse. And if you go there today and you see where the old city was located, it's just a heap of rubble. Now another city has been built up around about it. But the ancient city, the ruins, are just that, ruins today. Layer upon layer upon layer of conquered places. The city of a curse. And the Holy Spirit directed me to take a look at this city of a curse and see four specific events that happened there irregardless that it was a place of a curse. Because I don't know about you, but Columbus kind of seems like a city under a curse, doesn't it? Where we live, it seems like that the enemy is triumphing, that strongholds are being built, that pollution of people's spirit, mind, and body is taking place. And into this city of a curse, I've got great news. When a city under a curse collides with the power of an almighty God, marvelous, mighty things can happen. We examined last time the story, an episode, when the walls of the city of Jericho came crashing down. They were a barrier to the fulfillment of a promise that God made. You see, no promise God makes can be held back when God has made it. He said, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to give you this city. And the children of Israel marched around. They shouted before the walls even quivered or quaked. Shout, for he has given us the city. And the walls came falling down. We noted that in this city of a curse, this place called Jericho, that the walls that stood as barriers now could be walked over because they had fallen down. Aren't you glad? It doesn't matter the kind of curse that's come across our land, across our city, across our neighborhood, across our state, that God cannot shake the very foundations of the evil fortress of the enemy and bring it down to its knees. He can break every barrier. He can smash every stone, everything that stands between us and inheriting the promises of our God. Now, I'm just like you, I would rather see him just come in and just blow this place up and do a shaking in the spirit realm that everybody could see and hear. But sometimes he chooses to change the city of a curse by a very simple thing. We also noted a second great miracle that happened to a problem in the city of Jericho. The main spring had become polluted. 
rather than bringing life to the oasis called Jericho, it became another curse to the city of a curse. Things were dying. Crops were failing. Livestock were perishing. Children were being born with, with death on their sentence. All because the water had become polluted. We could look back and try and figure out how it was polluted. That's the big thing, you know, today. If you find how it got polluted, then you can fix it. The Bible doesn't tell us how. He just said that no matter how difficult the circumstance, he had a simple solution for it. The people came to Elisha and said, this is a, a great place, but the water is death to us. And he called upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord gave him a very simple instruction. Go take a container of salt. Not lightning bolts from beyond, but a simple container of salt. And go up to the edge of that spring that's become polluted and just take that little bit of salt and throw it in in faith and I'm going to heal the waters. We noted last time that it may not be the, the big bombastic earthquake of stones falling down. It may be as simple as salt and light going out to heal our community. Because you're the salt of the earth, you know that? Amen. You, well, I don't, I don't feel like it. Well, and maybe you aren't. But you're supposed to be. We're supposed to be. Amen. Jesus said if the salt loses its savor, it's not good for much, but putting down on your patio to cut up the ice from forming. I don't want to be just thrown out on the sidewalk. I want to be the salt and light of my community. We need to be a lighthouse in a darkened land. We need to be a people that when we go out into the world, when we leave this assembly and we go out into the world, that every place we go, there's the salt of your testimony, of your prayer, of your witness, of your life, of your speech that impacts. Well, it's not as bombastic as walls falling down. But the result is the same. When the problem of man collides with the power of an almighty God, marvelous things happen. You know, we need to see this city of a curse in which we live impacted. We're believing for a great move of God, but sometimes the move of God starts with just a little bit of salt being put into the polluted stream. Well, what difference can, can, can I make? What difference can we here at Trinity make? What difference can we make? We're few in number, and, and the, the problem is great. Elisha could have said the same thing, right? This is a spring that produces 10,000 gallons an hour. It feeds the whole area. It irrigates the whole. What difference can one little palm full of salt make? But he didn't question. He knew he was not dealing with the salt. He was dealing with the one who can shake things yeah. up. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And he poured it in. And the waters were made sweet. City of a curse. Walls and barriers can fall down. Polluted things can be made sweet when the Almighty God steps in. Well, we're going to some different places today. We're going to get in our time machine and we're going to go from Elisha Spring and we're going to fast forward another thousand years or so. And there's a big stir in the city. You see, Jericho is an out-of-the-way place. It's one of those, how many of you ra were raised in a place where you had to be going there to get there? <laughs> Any of you know what I'm saying? It's not one of those big, wide spots. I, I, I grew up in Mifflinville. 
How many of you know where Mifflinville is? Exactly. And uh, we had one sign. You are now entering. You are now leaving Mifflinville. It was all on the same sign. You had to be going there to get there. That's the way Jericho was. It's down at the bottom. It's down at the base of, of Israel. It's out near the, the desert area. It's, it's treacherous. It's difficult. But Jesus wound up there. Jesus decided to go to a place you had to purpose to get there. He had an objective or two. And we're going to talk about them today. What happens when the problems of men and women, boys and girls and teenagers collide with the power of an almighty God? You know the story well. This is one of those characters I've never tried to do in a drama because old Zach was short. <laughs> the only time I felt short was when I pastored in Oxford, Ohio, and we had some of the basketball team come into some of our services. And I had to get a stiff neck looking at some of the big boys there. This crowd is gathered, and Jesus has purposed in his heart to go to Jericho, the city of the curse. Doesn't he know that it's an accursed place? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you know, a curse doesn't phase Jesus. Jesus and the crowd are walking into the city. And the crowd is, is they're, they're milling around, they're talking, whatever. And, and, and they hardly bump into Jesus when he stops. And he looks up into a tree. And he knows the guy by name. Amen. Folks, think about this. We have no other reference that he'd been there before. We have reference he was there after at another occasion. How did he know this single, solitary person's name? Because he's the son of Almighty God. Amen. He knew his name. He called him by name. He did not walk by and say, oh, there's, there's a guy up in the tree Hey, uh, what, what's your name again? That's what I have to do a lot because I forget people's names. How many of you are with me? You can't even remember your own name some days. You know, you got problems. We had, pro we had issues. Yeah. I used to have problems with my memory, but I, well, never mind. Uh, he didn't stop and, and throw out some massive thing. Well, whoever's up there, come on down. No, he knew him by name. He knew that this one guy, Zacchaeus, had a problem. He lived in a city under a curse, and he had an even bigger problem than that. You see, he was wealthy. It says he was rich. Now, I don't know what rich means, because I've never visited that place before. <laughs> but I can only imagine. Zacchaeus was the head of the IRS in uh, that city, the Israeli Revenue Service. And he, uh, he uh, collected taxes. Back in those days, the Roman government who was in charge, they gave out franchises. And you were to collect this amount of tax for the Roman government, for the roads and the streets and everything else, and to keep Rome in, in good shape. And then you could charge whatever else you wanted for your taxes. And you got to keep the difference if you were a franchise owner. He was the franchise owner of the IRS from Jericho. And he used his position to make an enemy out of every single person in that town. Because he would just not only get the tax from Rome, but he was doing quite well himself. He was overcharging, overcharging. 
and he was pocketing the difference. Everybody in town hated him, but on the other hand, everybody in the town wanted to be him. They wanted to grow up and have the beautiful house that he had. It's been several years since I've been to Jericho, but if you go to Jericho, you'll find that there is a very poor section of town. And then there is an elite section of town today. The Palestinians have gotten money that they've never paid back to the World Bank. And you know what the leaders of the Palestinian movement did to try and help the, the poor people, the Palestinian people of Jericho? They built some of the biggest mansions you've ever seen in your life. The poverty is still there. But in that city, there was poverty, but there was also one big mansion. And Zacchaeus owned it. He was wealthy. He dressed in the finest clothing. He had everything that money could buy, and he had money left over. The people hated him, and yet at the same time wanted to be like him. But they didn't realize what was going on on the inside of this short fellow named Zacchaeus. You see, he was short of stature, but he brought up everybody else to their knees with his taxation. The people that were taller than he had to bow before him and grovel because he could bring them to their knees financially. But inside, he's not a happy man. Inside, he has a, an open sore. He has an emptiness on the inside that money can't fill and possessions can't buy and all of the perks of being the wealthiest man in town cannot fill the void on the inside of a person's heart. Only Jesus can fill that emptiness. He was wealthy. People envied him. He pitied himself. He was a sad individual. But then somebody let him know, Jesus is coming to town. Jesus. It, may have, it probably wasn't a direct conversation with him. He probably overheard it because people didn't like him. They didn't talk to him. They didn't want to see him. How many of you are best buds with your IRS agent? I didn't think so. Reva's had to talk to him several times recently. But uh, she, you're not friends, though. But, but you're on good speaking terms, you know, from the church. But you know what? The situation is this. He had heard that Jesus was coming, and somebody said something that he overheard. And it gave him a hope. He's a hated man with hatred even to himself, nobody likes him or cares for him in a city under a curse. And yet, one word gave him hope. And the name was Jesus. You see, we don't understand it. You say, well, I can't really preach or teach or anything like that. But can you share the name? of Jesus with somebody. You say, but what good will that do? Because when you lay it out there, the Holy Spirit can do His job. And He will convict of sin. He will convince of your need of Jesus. He will do His work if we'll do just passing along the name. I, I don't imagine that any of the people were extending an invitation to Zacchaeus to be a part of their crowd. They didn't like him. They didn't want to be around him. But Zacchaeus heard enough to know that Jesus had purposed in his heart to come to that city of a curse. And he began to think, he said, I, I just think he could do something. I, I feel so empty. I feel so all alone. You are all alone, Zacchaeus. Nobody likes you. But you know what? When he 
he heard the name of Jesus, hope rose up. And he says, how can I get to see him? I, I don't want to, if I get out in that crowd, they might just kill me. They, they hate me that much. And so he crawled up in the sycamore fig tree. And he looked over. All he wanted to do was see Jesus. But Jesus had better plans than that. Jesus knows when people have a hope birthed in their heart, and he comes after you. And when that procession stopped by that tree, the people were bumping into each other all the way back. What in the world is he stopping for? There's no figs on that tree. No. But there's somebody up in that tree that has hope. Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house today. Nobody else in town will. The moment that he came down, the people began just throwing a fit. Well, we came out to meet him. We, we came out to throng him in this big procession to come in, and he's going to go to a sinner's house. Oh, yeah. Because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, when the, the problems of man collide with the power of an almighty God, it's not just about a city. It's not just about a spring. It can get all the way down to just one single person in that city. And if we would share the name of Jesus with them. You say, well, I get tongue-tied. Can you say Jesus? How many could make it to say Jesus? How many, how many could do that? Oh, let's try it together. Some of you are a little hesitant. Do you know the guy we're talking about here? How many of you know him as your Savior? How many of you know him as your healer? You know him as your baptizer? You know him as your Lord and your coming King? Can I hear the name again? Jesus. Can I hear the name Jesus. that's above every other name? Jesus knew his name too. And Jesus had the solution because he looked in and he saw this one person. He had surrounded by a crowd, but he focused on one person. We can get our eyes on the crowd sometimes, and forget about the individual. But Jesus never does. I'm glad because many times I'm just a part of the crowd. How about you? Nobody knows your name. You ever realize that? You're a number to most people. You're a number. And you're a nobody. I have great news. I know somebody who knows your name. I know somebody that purposed in his heart to be here today. We live in an area that seems to be under a curse. You just turn on the news of an evening and pick which side of town somebody got killed in. Or they're burning things up over here, or they're blowing things up over there, they're crashing over here, they're, they're drunk drivers over here, there's all kinds of things going on. We're under a curse. We're under a curse. A curse of sin that's trying to drag people to an eternity in hell. But we have a name. And he knows their name. And when he came down, something happened on the inside of Zacchaeus. He was changed. Jesus mentioned it. He said, you know, I, I, I'm under such conviction. Jesus didn't even mention anything to him. Just called him by name and said, I'd like to go to your house. The, Holy, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is upon him from the moment his name was called. And he, he said, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make right. I've been, I've been bad. I've been doing evil things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fourfold... Uh, do retribution and restitution for all the things that I've done. And, and, and Jesus saw his heart. And he says, I've got some good news. 
salvation has come to this house today. One house in the whole city. The whole city's under a curse. But you know what? Everybody in that city is going to be affected by the one person who gave his heart to Jesus. Because what's Zacchaeus going to do? He's going to restore what he stole. Everybody in town that has been ripped off by this guy is going to receive something back. You know what? When even one person in a community, one person in an area gives their heart to Jesus and their sins are washed, washed away and their heart is made clean and eternal life imparted to them, everybody they come in contact with can be revolutionized and affected by the change of one single solitary soul. Amen. It doesn't take the walls falling down. It doesn't take a handful of salt. But even one person in a cursed town can affect everybody in that town. Before we go further to the fourth story, that happened in the city of a curse. I want to let you know today, Jesus, by the promise of his word, is passing by. He purposed to be here today. How many of you are gathered in his name? Jesus says, that's where I want to be. I have purposed in my heart, wherever two or three, can I get a show of hands, any two or three here? You came in Jesus' name, didn't you, brother? Amen? Amen. You came to bless his name. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, he says, I'm going to purpose to be there. And you may be up a tree in the circumstances in which you find yourself. You may be without hope. You may be in a situation where people hate you and detest you. But I've got good news. He knows your name. And he has a solution for what ails you. For some it may be there's sin in your life and it needs to be confessed and cast out by the power of God. You need to be born again. Some need, have gotten off track a little bit. And, and they, you're just not living for him. And you need to get back on the straight and narrow way. And some are facing problems of the things around you. You're living in a city of a curse and, and you're surrounded by people who just don't like you. But you know what? You know what? He knows your name. And he knows your situation. And Jesus doesn't care about the things that are against you. He says, I'm going with you. And this day, salvation comes to the house. It doesn't matter what your issue is. You're just a single, solitary person with a problem. And when your problem collides with the power of an almighty God, salvation and healing and wholeness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that may be some of your, your problem. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need the, the desire to be a witness, to share the name of Jesus. Jesus impacted the whole town when he impacted one. One. Well, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us how long it was between the first time that Jesus went to the city of a curse and the next time. But there was a next time. And Jesus is approaching the city, and the crowd is there again. I bet Zacchaeus is in the crowd this time. People like him now. People like him now. I, I kind of imagine Zacchaeus is in the crowd now. And this crowd, you know, when you've been in a crowd, there's all kind of crowd noise. But all of a sudden, there was a, a cry that went louder than the noise of the crowd. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy, have mercy on me. 
Let me read it for you in Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 35. And it happened as Jesus was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, immediately, he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. His name was Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And he sat there his entire adult life, blind, unable to see. But somebody told him that Jesus was passing. But that, you know, the same thing that happened to Zacchaeus. Somebody told him Jesus had purposed to come that way. And faith rose in his heart. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me that. Your faith has made you well. The name of Jesus spoken to the people around about us can raise faith to a level where we begin to believe and the Holy Spirit bears witness with our hearts. Yes, yes, He can do something. He can do something about your situation. The noise of the crowd was overshadowed by the cry of one. Now, he wasn't just Jesus, son of David. Huh? Jesus, good stuff. Jesus, good. You're not going to hear that kind of cry. His cry went over all the crowd noise, split right through it. I like to think back to the day of Pentecost when 120 voices lifted up in praise to God in languages they never learned overshadowed the 50 or 60,000 people up on the Temple Mount to the place where they stopped and they started asking, well, what, what does this mean? You see, people, we've got to have a cry and an urgency in our hearts and lives that overwhelms the murmuring of the crowd around us. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He cried out for mercy, but you know what he got? Grace. He cried out for mercy, and God extended his grace of healing. He came to Jesus, and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? You say, well, that's kind of a goofy question, a silly question. He's blind. Didn't Jesus know he was blind? No, if Jesus knows the name of the tax collector, and he'd never met him, he certainly knows what Bartimaeus' problem is. But you know, a big part of the time is we don't know what our own problem is. We don't know what we're really after. He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said, done. Your faith has made you whole. Far too often we allow the murmuring of the crowd around us, the complaints and the whining and everything else, to snuff out 
our cry at the mercy seat. But the Bible tells us we're to come boldly, strongly, urgently to his throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. If we have an attitude of, well, you know, he's coming by. If he comes this way, fine. If he doesn't, fine. Jesus wouldn't have heard the cry and the man would not have received his healing miracle. It says a lot about urgency, desperation. The people came up to him and said, keep your mouth shut. You're bothering Jesus. Shut up. You're making us look bad. He's come to visit our town. We've heard about all the wonderful things he's done. He's come to do some great things here. Uh, You're messing things up. You know what? The world doesn't care about your problem. Satan really doesn't care about your problem. But Jesus does. And he wants to know you're serious about a solution. You won't be dissuaded. You won't be put down. You're going to call upon the name of the Lord for his mercy and find his grace. The Bible does not tell us that we are to be arrogant or pushy with God. I've heard teaching that people say, well, you just demand it of God. Find that one in the book. No. Have you noticed God doesn't really care for pushy people? But persistent, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. Not coming in arrogance, not demanding that he do something. Because it's only His grace. Only His grace. His grace gets us into the kingdom, and if He never did another thing, that's sufficient. His grace is enough. We sang about it this morning. Folks, He wants to extend mercy in a variety of ways. How do we know if we don't ask? But we don't ask demanding. You know, Bartimaeus did not say, I hear you're the Son of God. Heal me. Right now. Right this way. Right now. Now Come on. Right now. I don't know about you, but I don't worship a God who can be bossed around. Huh? Lord, that I might receive my sight. And God called it faith. Jesus called it faith. And the man's sight was restored. And all the the people in that crowd of this city of the curse, what did they do? They began to glorify God and praise the name of the Lord. One city under a curse and four different special impacts of the power of God. One was breaking down every barrier to the victory that God had promised. Another was focused on just a little bit changing the whole thing. Another, a single person rippling out to affect everyone else. And here, one miracle and the entire multitude began to get their eyes off of the miracle and on to the miracle working mighty God. How is God going to turn around our city of a curse? I don't know. But I see four illustrations of a variety of ways that God can turn the situation around. It may be a bombastic knocking down of barriers and walls as we begin to pray and shout before the Lord, for he has given us the city. We're going to be giving you more information about in October, the 
Franklin Graham is bringing his crusade here. And we're going to be gathering down at noontime downtown at the Capitol building. And we're going to be praying. Christians, we're not hearing speeches and all this kind of stuff. No picketing and all that kind of stuff. We're going to be praying. We're going to talk to the God who can do something about our sin. And I believe that shout going up of prayer can impact our city. They see a lot of picketers and a lot of protesters and things like that, parades and whatever. But you know what they haven't seen? Is the church rising up with a voice of prayer, with a shout of praise, and saying, God, you alone are the solution to the curse that's on our city. Is he going to do it through that? I believe that's one aspect. I believe another aspect is that the salt needs to get out of the shaker and out into the world. It needs to get out of our little gathering here and out where it can impact the pollution of sin in our society. You know that most people aren't ever going to be here I, I finally realized that. You know, most people in town aren't going to be here at Trinity. But you know what? That doesn't stop us from touching them where they are. The salt, the salt and light going out and impacting the little, giving flavor to the greater. That's another aspect of him dealing with the curse of this city. And the single person that you share the name of Jesus can be the person that impacts person after person after person. Just like Zacchaeus. And people become believers because of that one person. And likewise with Bartimaeus. One person exercising faith and refusing to be silenced by the pressure of the crowd. There's a big pressure out there not to lift up the name of Jesus anymore. Have you noticed? People want to take one nation under God. They want to take that right out of the pledge. You can go to civic organizations, and I have personally experienced this, where they said, we wanted you, uh, Reverend, we wanted you to lead in prayer over the meal, over the meeting but uh, you cannot use the name of Jesus. And I've had to inform them, I'm sorry, I have nothing to pray about if I don't use the name of Jesus. Because he is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Amen. The crowd wants to silence the cry for Jesus. up to us to cry above the murmurings of the crowd Jesus son of David have mercy on us what happens when the problems of men and women and boys and girls and teenagers collide with the power of an almighty God city of the curse is turned around. The walls can be broken down that hinder us from victory. The pollution that is all around can be made sweet as you become a witness. The most hated person can be the person God uses. He's done it so many times. You think about somebody that was hated in the early church. Saul of Tarsus, he was a bad dude. You know, we could be, if we were the early church, we could be sitting here this morning and a guy comes in with armed guards and starts arresting you, taking you outside, putting you on some horses and chariots or just dragging along behind and he's going to take you off to jail and ultimate death. 
He's not the person that you want to invite to church that day. But he had an encounter with somebody named Jesus. And look at all the people he affected after that. I believe there's some Saul of Tarsus kind of people that you know, that I know, that we know. That if, have you ever thought about this? Boy, if that person would ever give their heart to the Lord. Wow, what an influence, what an impact. You'd be praying for that person. You'd be witnessing to that person. You'd be sharing with that person. Because God can turn a cursed city around. We have four illustrations in the scripture. You know, I think he'd like to have another illustration about this cursed city. When Jesus came to town and turned things around. Barriers to victory laid waste, pollution undone and sweetened. Blind eyes open and a single soul saved that rippled out to impact a whole group of people. Would you stand with me please? As a song of invitation begins softly behind me, I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. Close your eyes this morning and I want you to think about the fact of these four illustrations of what happened in a cursed city when it collided with the power of an almighty God. Before we give invitation, I want you to, I want to see what side of the ledger you're on today. Can I see the uplifted hands of those who would say, I want to see Jesus collide with the city I live in, with the problems that surround us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zacchaeus, I believe that the Holy Spirit has given you a hope today. Things can be different through Jesus. I have good news. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. And he calls you to come and be with him. The altar is open. Should you leave where you're standing and come forward? are going to be here to pray with you or you can come to the altar and you can seek the Lord by yourself. He knows your name. How many of you have some things that stand as barriers to living the victorious life? And you want to see those barriers, those walls come down. Would you come and find a place to pray? anybody here that's seeking, earnestly seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you, let that wall fall down, receive the free gift of heaven, and be transformed in your power. Would you come? Sickness and disease, maybe a hesitancy to be the salt. 